But that's simply not possible. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? I've just started this calypso. It is fucking minging. Paradise punch lemonade. It is fucking minging. Suck your dad. It's minging. It's fucking minging. This is a little bit more than just an analysis of Disco Elysium. This is my love letter to this game. Quick disclaimer, this contains spoilers for the game and I wouldn't be able to say what I have to say without going into details. I highly encourage you to play it first. It's really good. Also, I will be mentioning briefly the ending of Firewatch. Disco Elysium is a story of redemption, self-analysis and self-discovery. It's a chance to begin again. And it is a chance to change. Lieutenant W. Freighter Harrier Dubois was one of the most important detectives of its precinct, solving an astonishing number of cases, rejecting the highest rank of the Ravashol citizens' militia twice, only to remain in the field as a detective. He was a successful gymnastic teacher in good shape and once had a fiancé. Although many of these details may be a little bit obscure because we are playing as Harry, and because some other self-destructive tendencies were present even before his downfall. But nevertheless, these are important elements of our character's previous story. Harry descended on a path to self-destruction after she left him, falling to alcoholism, drug addiction, and even as far as threatening to end his life on multiple occasions. When we begin this journey with Harry, he's a 44-year-old drunk who didn't want to be a police officer anymore, who wanted to die, to go to sleep and never wake up. He neglected his duties as a police officer and went on a two-day binge drink, left a rotten corpse to hang, and chased away his squad for quote-unquote cramping his style, sold his gun to buy more alcohol, and he stated it was a threat to his life and that he could not be trusted with it for the night. Caused disturbances to a cafeteria, destroyed his vehicle, and caused property damage just to mention a few things. When we take control of Harry, he wakes up hungover, suffering from withdrawal, having survived a heart attack and being a joke to absolutely everyone but his new partner. His new purpose is not only solving the case but also regaining his life after suffering from amnesia. He is giving a chance to be born again, that's how I see it. This is not only an important moment of the story but also mechanically speaking because this is what allows us to make choices in the game. Finding every little detail about Harry's past was one of the most remarkable things for me about this game, hearing more and more about him, reading incredible cases he solved. At one point in the game, an NPC calls him the human can opener. He could get any information out of anyone, he quote unquote opened them up like cans. Something as small and perhaps insignificant about a person can tell you so much about them. The mystery of the hangman and the cover up of the crime itself was interesting and how it got mixed with political situations and confrontations in this town as well as the ramifications this cover-up brought. And the people involved like Titus, Klasje or Ruby was very very intriguing as well. But finding more and more about Harry was what kept me going, also working towards a path of redemption so to speak. Not drinking, not taking drugs, behaving being smart and intelligent, empathetic, determined was my personal task. Even if it wasn't the main purpose of the story, it was for me. This game is not about becoming a disaster of a human being like the marketing has implied. It is about recovering from it because you already were. It's about becoming a better person and how it is a slow process. It's hard, it's painful, but if you persevere, the reward is unmeasurable. Plus something that I really like is at the beginning of the game everyone treats you like a joke. You're a joke to everyone and by the very beginning of the game you're already dealing with the consequences of your past. I am 100% aware that us players did not get a chance to, to decide who Harry was before the amnesia but I find it very intriguing that we have to deal with the consequences of his decisions. This story, if you want to, is about never giving up no matter if you hit rock bottom or an even rockier bottom. As long as you keep your head up, you'll always see the light and as long as you see the light, there's still a chance. It's no coincidence that the game starts from the pure darkness and it 
begins as we slowly open our eyes to wake up. Disco Elysium is a story about making new connections not only with yourselves from a sober and better perspective and with your emotions, quite literally, but also with new people and this world that is new to the player and to Harry due to his amnesia. One of the earliest tasks is for you to get a reality check down. This is a very good method that the game utilizes to expose the player to the world because our main character is not even aware of it in the first place. Therefore, what little exposition the game has, especially from named NPCs, feels very organic and natural because one, you're asking for it and two, you're learning along with Harry. When I say new connections, I think I mean with Kim Kitsuragi who has faith in you who will put up with your behavior as long as you show determination and that you still have it and that you're willing to fight for it. If you show him that you're still a very good detective or at least that you remotely care about something that gives meaning to your life, he will keep putting up with you. And I think a relationship may blossom. It is about making a connection with yourself. It's your personal experience showcased by how you can Talk with yourself and the personalities and attributes that hang around in your mind. Once again, I mean this literally. And it is emphasized when we meet the insulin, the infasmid. The conversations you have with it is personal, only meant for Harry and the player. Kim says it, but it's not for him. It's for Harry, for you and for me. That depends on what you choose to believe, of course, because the conversation with the insulin, the infasmid is locked behind an inland empire check. I also think it is about accepting some things are over and not being able to gain them back because actions have consequences. In speaking of consequences, I think this coalition makes great use of the concept of the passing of time. Not only is Revachol filled with bullet holes and stories and marks and remnants of the revolution, but I also really like that it is filled with both old middle age and young people and it is very intriguing to see how all of the three age groups are somehow adapting to this decaying new world and how each generation and i guess people in general have to deal with the consequences of their ancestors years pass our health both physically and mentally deteriorates we break connections we forget things we lose others we are incapable of doing things we used to we can even fall into self-destructive patterns but the hardest i think is accepting some things are over some things can ever be the same that's the hard part and then building after that start building with nothing left only you can carry your past mistakes the memory of the people we've lost the remains of our bad habits and behavior the moral hangover the scars the fights we won and the fights we lost but rebuilding from nothing is, I guess, easier. But one detail I would like to point out that was very intriguing to me when I was playing the game for the first time was that Harry was not a very young person. And I was thinking, yeah, it's kind of easier to rebuild from nothing, right? Quite literally, Harry is a blank canvas. But I also think it's kind of hard when you're trying to rebuild your life and you're already halfway through it. Some things are over and they're over. In the game you suffer for your failure, your actions have consequences. Not only you are a joke and are forced to tolerate everyone hating you and making fun of you for the actions that took place before the game started or for choosing a specific over the top or ridiculous dialogue option you pay. Everything has consequences in this game. You roll a dice in dialogue options. And I think even if you have a high chance of saying exactly what you mean, there is still a probability of failure. This is obviously attached to the dice mechanic of the game because it is based on percentage. But if you think about it, narratively speaking, it kind of makes sense because I think even if you prepare a specific argument based on whatever, there is still a chance that people are not going to take it the way you intend it and there is still a possibility that whatever you say may be wrong or may leave a different impression than what you were expecting. Going back to failure a little bit, regardless of whether you fail or not, 
it isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes you learn something from it. You learn how to improve or to take a different path. And this is why the ability to fail is necessary, not only in this game, but I guess in life as well. The game always lets you defend whatever you think. It lets you sink your nails into your argument and defend it like you're the last soldier standing in a war. This is emphasized with the political quest lines. Although I am 100% aware that the creators, that the writers are very left-leaning and are kind of geared towards socialist ideas. And they're not really afraid to let you know that some ideologies are just plain shit. The game even allows you to take the fascist and the racist approach to things. Going back to the story in general a little bit, also you don't really change the world. Sure, you solve the case, you make it back to your unit together, maybe recruit Kim after establishing a relationship with him or help Kuna recover and just generally be a better person and slowly regain your old glory, if you will. Maybe help some people around Martinez, repay guard, discover the mystery of the tomb commercial area, help some teenagers get off drugs and start a healthy nightclub in an event in church, giving both them and the building some purpose. You can help a failed game developer, help bring some closure to her and to others. You can also solve a case of a missing person. This is more, more like a side case and you can bring closure to the person's wife. You can dance one more time. You can basically invent a new genre of music before your old and damaged body says it's over. Your disco days are over. But you don't change the world as much as you do all of this. The war between the Union and Walpine still takes effect. The mercenaries still show up. There's still blood and only you can mitigate this by saving people, but the bullets will fly regardless. You are forced to fire your weapon upon the mercenaries. Martinez is still a dump. The fishing village will be gone. There will still be drugs on the street, etc, etc. The Clares are still a piece of shit and they will still control the Union and they will still rain Martinez with an iron fist. You can't change the world and you're not supposed to. Martinez, despite being a terribly sad district, is still one of the most memorable and beautiful maps of recent times. There's somehow beauty in it. This is, I think, slightly parallel to Cindy the Skull, one of the young adults who lives in one of the abandoned coal buildings in Martinez, close to the apartments. The only way she finds inspiration to paint or write something on the floor, whatever you want to call it, is with literal blood and violence and just a general bloodbath is what inspires her to do something beautiful, quote unquote. And I think it is very symbolic that her painting is made with literal blood and gasoline. But even if you light it on fire, which is extremely dangerous, of course, there's just something so poetic about it. I think it is a little parallel to Martinez as well. Going a little bit back, reality is disappointing. The killer responsible for Ellie's Cortanier's death, better known as Lili, is the last remaining communist that has been living on an island for decades. It's not anyone that you've met so far, and the only reason you go to this island is because the case was getting cold. And the motive? This person couldn't help himself. He had to take pot shots from his little island playing jury over the years. It just so happens that he hated this guy and that the deserter couldn't bear seeing Lila and Klaasia together, taking drugs, drinking and having sex for days. Those are things that he deemed distasteful say the very least. So what does he do? He performs an impressive shot backed up by an even more impressive motive. In instances, motivation, I think it is the true weapon. And what's very baffling to me is that the motive is so human, it's so ridiculous, and it's so bizarre and weird that it just makes sense. I guess it's, it's believable. Something I found very interesting when talking to the deserter is that he wanted to kill Rene, yet he died of old age. He couldn't get what he wanted. Reality is just plain disappointing. I can't help but point out the similarities between the killer and Harry, both sad people clinging to the past alone on an island, although Harry's island is both 
his trash motel room or his thoughts surrounded by a gigantic sea of misery and alcohol. Different islands, same meaning. The ending might have been disappointing to a lot of people, I compare it to Firewatch's ending, which has received the same comments and criticism, but reality truly is disappointing. In this coalition, the Hardy Boys' reason for covering the murder was simply for class J, and it was her idea in the first place, motives and strings of manipulations, and the shot was performed by an old man unable to let go, living on an equally old island. In Firewatch, there was no government, secret complex, or conspiracy theories, just lies, broken relationships, fear, and a guy running around in the woods who, again, couldn't let go. Just like Henry couldn't let go of his wife, just like Harry couldn't let go of his fiancé, his tragic past, and the mistakes he has made. Both scenarios, nothing mythical or extraordinary, peculiar, yes, but so surreal at the same time, yet so simple. I am aware that this coalition has literally a ginormous stick bug that talks to you if you have enough Inland Empire and I know there's nothing mundane or normal about that or about the world of this coalition but I think the motive is the same. When we met the Insulin Indian Fasmid, I took two important things about that particular conversation. The importance of identity and endurance, not blinking and not letting the world end. The second can be metaphorical or literal, the world isn't technically going to end now. Like I mentioned previously, the Fosmids conversation is one for the player and Harry, not for everyone, not for the world, for you and Harry. But it is heavily implied that the conversation is in Harry's head. So it is very bizarre and it is very much up for interpretation. But what is it about endurance? If you blink, the world is going to end. In only one blink, everything disappears. Blinking and letting everything go dark is easy. Not blinking and keep on living with every decision you made, everything you did, is the hard part. Try not to blink. If you do, you end it all and you can reassure the fast you won't do such a thing that that was a little nice thing to bring closure to Harry's story. This is of course metaphorical if you choose to say screw everything, screw this world. If you decide to end it, if you decide you're giving up on yourself, on the world around you, if you blink, suddenly all will be gone. I think Harry blinked once and that led to the beginning of this game. It's hard not to say screw everything because it's hard to keep on living. It's hard to choose life, especially when you are living in the past, leeching off your own nostalgia, consuming it like it's a hard drug pouring memories down your throat like it's Al Ghul until they start to stink, until you can get the smell off and it becomes a part of you. And I guess identity is the other prominent thing here. Identity is what keeps us around, what keeps us sane, what gives us a purpose, how we present to the world, how much we mean and how much we matter in the scheme of things. Believing in something, it's the only thing that separates us from animals. Going a little bit back to the last standing communist, he chose to hold on to whatever identity he had left rather than letting go. Fighting the war for identity is a task that one must endure alone, and a war we must win, although victories can be subjective as well. What is your purpose? asks the Insulindian Fasmi to the player. What does it mean to have an identity? No matter how much of a disaster of a human being Harry can become, he's still a detective. Kim respects you for this, he says. Harrier is one of the best he's ever seen. It's literally the only thing keeping you tied to this mess of a world. And it's the same for everyone, for the Hardy Boys, for Kim, for the Deserter, for the Cryptozoologists. Hell, even for the Mercs, at least they have an identity as twisted and as bad as they can get. And I also think it's very symbolic that Class J kind of lacks one. She's one of the most deprived, depressed, and miserable and screwed up characters in the game. And what I mean with lacking an identity is that Klasje isn't even her real name and her whole identity or her whole persona is based on manipulating people. It's essentially being someone she's not. And I guess lacking an identity or being able to switch it so often is what makes her so dangerous and so odd because she lies to you from the very first moment you meet her to the very last. 
there is no way you can trust her even after you uncover a different name or some sort of information everything has a purpose class j is someone who's extremely focused on self-preservation above everything else and once again i think that's why lacking an identity is, is what makes her so powerful going back to that last hour of the game and harry getting a chance to begin again here's what strikes me the most he gets a chance when half of his life is over after he gives up after he screws up over and over again after he loses everything no more disco no more happiness it's all darkness a bloated corpse of a trunk he still got the chance and not everyone gets a second chance that's why it not only is a hell of a task to pull up it's a hell of a task to fall to the deepest darkness and to endure and to clench to an identity this game can be incredibly nihilistic but also very optimistic as well but is it ever too late to begin again no it's never late until it's over i walk away from this game with the fact that this is perhaps my favorite video game now one that has handled a lot of themes with so much care with amazing art a soundtrack that transports you into a different world and that connects directly with your emotions it was beautifully written with beautifully written characters as well and a tremendously great story and there are so many things i wanted to talk about but i couldn't fit i wanted to cover a little bit the idea of harry being a police officer and how that allows you to pick various dialogue options that are not necessarily very sane -y. I wanted to talk about the political quests and I wanted to analyze this game under a, a queer theory. Like I said, there's so much I wanted to say about this game, but I just wanted to, I guess, talk about the first impression that this game left me, the emotional impression. I want to end this by reading a quote to you. The bloating might never leave your face, but beneath it, you still have some years. You still have some hope. Sunrise Parabellum. Okay. Well, that was a game that definitely hit a spot with me. I made a very similar video about a year ago, I think. About close to two years ago. And it was about self-reflection. And like I said, this is a very emotional game, at least to me. I know there are a lot of very important aspects when it comes to this coalition. Um, for example, the mechanics, the RPG mechanics specifically, and how it ties to some of those older RPGs. And it is a very strong new RPG. And also, for example, the political quest, the NPCs, the world, and even the concept of disco itself. There's just so much food for thought, so much topics to talk about but i wanted to focus a little bit on the emotional aspect and well that's pretty much it thank you so much for watching it was a slightly longer video um i was working with a script that was edited and trimmed various times and i didn't even cover the whole thing but anyways thank you so much for watching or i guess listening it means a lot feel free to support my patreon if you're interested also, if you're interested in the original Disco Elysium video, it will be listed in the description down below, as well as a live stream where I was playing the Doom commercial area side quest. I think I'll even make some more content about this game in the future. Maybe. I'm still thinking about that queer theory, or I guess analyzing the game through a very specific um, queer line of thought. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and listening. Please take care and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.